Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Have a great show for you today. So nationalism is, of course, a hot topic. There's been a battle, of course, on the left. Nationalism is evil. It's terrible. It's the worst thing one could imagine, unless you're Ukrainian, in which case blood and soil nationalism, nationalism suddenly becomes an essential part of what you're doing. Same thing on the right. Of course, there's been the battle over Christian nationalism, whether this is something that should be the center of uh, kind of a right wing reordering of politics. But then we see, of course, something like the Israeli war pop off and all of a sudden nationalism is a very clear thing that everyone should support on the right as well. And so I wanted to talk to Jeremy Carl. He's, of course, a senior fellow over at the Claremont Institute about nationalism and why we seem so confused about the topic. Jeremy, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Oren. Absolutely. All right, guys, we're going to dive into all that in one second. Before we do, let's hear from today's sponsor. These days, it's impossible to thrive with just one job. Between increasing living costs, paying off debts, and planning for the future, things like buying a home, building savings, and even going on vacation can seem like fantasies. If your goal is financial freedom, you could start taking on more hours at your current job, work towards a promotion, or try putting your money into something risky like stocks, cryptocurrencies, or even a side hustle. But at the end of the day, do you really want to sacrifice time and energy that could otherwise be spent with your loved ones or on your hobbies just to make a living? Luckily, you don't have to hustle to reliably make more money. All you have to do is job stacking. Job stacking is the best way for regular people, regular employees, to unleash their earning potential and increase job and financial security. How? By working multiple jobs, but without burning out or more importantly, getting caught by corporate overlords. Job stacking allows you to reliably receive paychecks from multiple employers each month without having to work more than eight hours a day. You don't have to be in tech or any particular field or industry to do it as long as you can work remotely. If you've thought about working multiple jobs, but you're not sure how to start or are afraid of getting caught, get the fundamental job stacking course today and learn all of the secrets on how to sustainably work multiple full-time jobs from the foremost expert on the matter, Rolf Halza, author of Job Stacking. Rolf has worked multiple full-time jobs since 2018, including hybrid jobs, and has condensed all of his experiences and wisdom into a single four-module online course so you can start proficiently job stacking without having to make mistakes, figuring things out on your own, or reinventing the wheel in the process. Go to www.jobstacking.com and enter the promo code ORIN to get a special discount. All right, Jeremy. So obviously we seem to have some deep confusion in the United States about what nationalism is, whether or not it's desirable. If not nationalism, then what would be the other kind of political order that we should seek? I think a lot of people, of course, think that the nation state is a fundamental building block of the way that we organize ourselves politically. But for some reason, just referring to someone as a nationalist is very scary. Why is that the case on both the left and the right? Well, I think it's it's sort of coded. It's not an official thing that has anything to do with with per se being a nationalist, which uh, is not an infinite, um, infinitely old political concept. I mean, we did have uh, different civilizational uh, sort of ways of arranging things before we had the nation state, which is a more of a modern invention. But I think there is a tendency among critics of nationalism to you know say ah oh, well nationalism is like national socialism or it's sort of this excessive patriotism and means that you hate everywhere else or uh, you know they try to sort of put all of this luggage or baggage on the top of nationalism that are not really intrinsic to the nationalist project but they sort of try to load it down with various negative uh kind of concepts such that uh, it will be discredited in people's eyes. Is this just a feature of kind of the scale of social organization? Of course, early on, city states, you know, much smaller units of political organization were the key. You did have empires, but empires tended to be ruled from one central kind of city state, and then they would allow other uh, rulers yeah. to kind of control their regions. Is it just that we are now more interconnected and this issue suddenly crops up? I think that's part of it. And I think part of the, the blowback to nationalism is precisely also this interconnection. You know, you sort of talk about uh, even Trump will sort of talk about nationalists versus globalists. Right. And so we have this level of interconnection that is inherent, even when we're living in nation states today. And so uh, there's a tendency to say, well, you know, we're global citizens or or whatever have you. I mean, these are things we normally associate uh, more with the left, although I think they're absolutely conservative globalists. And in fact, uh, they've had way too much power, in my view, in the Republican Party 
for quite some time. Um, but I do think that that probably the nation state is kind of um, a result of of the greater scale that we're able to have due to technology to to some degree. Um, but having said that, of course, nation states can be of tremendously different size, scale, population. Uh, I mean, I don't know technically whether uh, political theorists of nationalism would consider Monaco with its uh, one and a half square miles or whatever it is, a full on nation. But certainly you could point to a place like Singapore, maybe that is certainly uh, a nation, even though it's very, very small, I think 280 square miles or something. And then you have Russia. Right. So what we call a nation state uh, or a nation can vary dramatically in scale. It can vary dramatically in population, uh, et cetera, even all within the same umbrella of organization. Yeah, and I think that's really the problem is the terminology is just everywhere. And, and I think even the orientation that people understand, a lot of people would have thought of nationalism as a left wing project back in, say, the 17 or 1800s, right? You're breaking down monarchies, you know, you're getting rid of these reactionary governments and replacing it with democracy and, and, and right. rule of law and all these things. And so th these were left wing, in some sense, movements breaking down uh, more traditional forms of organization now it's considered a staunchly right-wing idea in many cases but like you said it seems to apply both to you know small islands and giant continent or multi-continent empires that right. there doesn't seem to be any real grasp of what a nation could be sure and you do see of course within some of the bigger nations some tensions even within that project uh russia is federated in all sorts of really uh, complicated ways. And as a non-Russia expert, I wouldn't even uh, pretend to get in uh, to all of them, but there are various autonomous communities and states and 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 other sorts of things, some of them d dating from the Soviet era, um, where uh, they've tried to kind of uh, put this very unwieldy, large geographic area together under um, a nation, uh, kind of the umbrella of a nation. In the US, obviously, even the South is in some way uh, kind of its own nation, at least culturally in certain ways. But you could easily say the same thing about the, the West Coast to a lesser degree or or New England or, you know, we, we have nations within the fundamental nation state, depending on how you want to define them. And to some degree, uh, we get back to what the sociologist Benedict Anderson called imagined communities, which is to say that all of these communities, I, I don't kind of go as far as Anderson does. I mean, I do think that they're actually real things about them, but we sort of create our own political communities ultimately over time. And, and that kind of creates its own meaning. In fact, even Palestine, I think one could make pretty persuasive arguments. I think um, the Palestinian people consider themselves a nation right now, but I, I think that that was a much more amorphous concept a century ago when a lot of these wars really got uh, began to, to kick off. And so uh, it, it's hard to kind of pin down nationalism or what a nation even is uh, at any given point of time when you're talking about a group of people they can be unstable over time, uh, despite the sort of proponents who will try to always claim oh, they're, they're eternal. Yeah, and we can kind of see this in the way that the United States, again, ha has kind of adopted what seems like proxy nationalism, right? For the left, again, it's it's supposed to be against nationalism. We're all universal citizens. We're global citizens. It's a global village. But at the minute that Russia crosses the border into Ukraine, all of a sudden, Ukraine becomes a very real place with a real people and real traditions. Right. You know, it, it, all of a sudden, it becomes uh, very sacred. Same thing for the right. right. You know, the, it just feels like there's, there's this desperate need. People will understand the need for this kind of uh, this kind of organizing identity, but they they want to pick and choose when it gets invoked. When it, it may, maybe only when it's part of the global project for the left. What do you think about that? Absolutely, and I mean, even if you go back to uh, for those of us of a certain age who who still have some memory of of the Soviet era, um, I remember when it was the Ukraine, and it was sort <laughs> of just a part of the Soviet nation. And you know, it, it took some years before I could even say Ukraine as a proper, oh, this is a real country that has its own separate identity. And obviously, by the way, and I, I'm truly not trying to take sides here, I'm not suggesting that there wasn't a language and a culture and, and other things that were uh, certainly typical of U Ukraine at, way before 1989. But it is to say that for a long time, Ukraine existed within this, this nation that was the Soviet Union, 
uh, that called itself the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, and <laughs> it wasn't really seen by outsiders as kind of being its own nation. And over time, it took on um, that sort of a role. And, and these sorts of things can be very mobile over time. I mean, if you look at, say, Poland over the last century, and you kind of look at the map of where Poland was, I mean, Poland literally physically moved uh, over time. I'm actually uh, in Hungary right now for a little while, uh, for a few weeks. Hungary is a, na a nation that has a much larger cultural and civilizational history than its current borders that have a lot to do with how wars turned out over the last hundred years. And so you go to the Hungarian National Art Gallery, which I did today, and you'll see lots of things. And I'll talk about this great Hungarian painter from this city that you know had a Hungarian name. But you know today it's in Slovakia, today it's in Romania. And so uh, what constitutes a nation even can really uh, change dr dramatically over time. So for the right, there, there's... Obviously, there's a more interest in nationalism there. You have the idea, of course, Donald Trump coming out rather controversially for some reason at the time, uh, saying, I'm a nationalist. This this was a huge deal. This is, is very transgressive. Hey, I'm running for the presidency of a nation. I am therefore right. a nationalist. But this was this is incredibly scandalous. The, the question I think that has now come up for a lot of <laughs> for a lot of people on the right is what that means. And uh, there, there's been an attempt. I think uh, for from many in the in the evangelical movement to look at a Christian nationalism and say, okay, well, the the purely propositional American nation seems to have some serious problems, right? We 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 people are supposed to come in and they they become Americans because they say an oath and they believe in a creed, but if they stop believing in the creed or they renounce the oath they still stay Americans. So it doesn't seem actually very propositional. So, so there seems to be a, a driving for something else, an identity that's beyond just a, 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 a creedal uh, identity in the United States. And they seem to be driving towards a religious identity, but that also seems scandalous even for many right-wingers. Absolutely. And, and the Christian nationalism debate is in some ways even trickier because there's so many different definitions, even among uh, uh, you know, Stephen Wolf, who's kind of written the biggest book on this at this point, The Case for Christian Nationalism. In fact, it's really the only kind of sy systematic, synthetic book that I'm aware of on the subject, even though a lot of people talk about it. But, you know, he has his definition. Other people have their own definition. And and whether or not they're for it uh, really depends on how they're defining Christian nationalism, which is, of course, in its in and of itself, a creedal faith, but uh, Wolf in his book and in his talks, I mean, he he does kind of make reference to an ethnos as part of that, which is not uh, is not necessarily racial, but it's a group of people that see themselves as a group that have the sort of same customs, mores, traditions. They see themselves as having a common history in a certain way, um, and and you know he sort of suggests that their Christianity is is I think quite correctly a part of that history. Uh, core part of that history and what it means to be an American, which doesn't mean, of course, that you can't be American if you're not Christian, but but sort of the role that Christianity plays uh, and how close it is to the state is is sort of central to the question, uh, Christian nationalist project. Yeah, I have my own issues with Christian nationalism. Not that I uh, disagree with the fact that Christian principles should be, you know, uh, woven into in, into our law or the way that we kind of understand our identity, but just that, you know, Armenia is also a Christian nation. So that seems sure. you know, perhaps necessary, but insufficient to an actual definition of American identity. I, I do think it's interesting. Of course, a lot of people uh, immediately when they hear nationalism, they hear ethno nationalism, you know, that that's, yeah. that's kind of the, the, the red flag that a lot of people, even people yeah. who are on the right are, are worried about this. And you brought up an important point there that is, is really critical. A lot of people have conflated race and ethnos in a way that I think is a, an absolute tragedy because right. I think the the identity of pretty much every peoples throughout history would have been defined as an ethnos. And and, sure. and, and there's many what would be considered right wing or reactionary authors that actually lamented this this kind of vulgar transition from the idea of ethnos to genetic race. Right. Uh, when, when this started to become a thing in, in the 1900s, 
and, and I think the fact that that is an idea that that even the right seems unable to separate anymore is a real failure in their ability to to understand what would be necessary to have a a nation that could combine people into one identity but not be running some kind of one drop purity test throughout its right. population right no exactly and in fact I, i've got a, a forthcoming book that looks at some of these issues uh coming out early next year and one of the things i talk about is sort of how do you recreate an american ethnos because i mean there's plenty of people just to be fair who would say we shouldn't you know we can just be this happy totally multicultural group um with you know a bunch of very distinct cultures maybe even without all that much in common but we're all sort of living under the same umbrella and you can say well maybe you no know, it's actually all creedal and as i think you correctly point out hey we're not kicking out people who don't believe in whatever elements you or i might define as the american creed uh secondly even figuring out what that creed is i think is questionable but i sort of look at well you know what would it take to reconstitute a majority ethnos and majority culture out of you know out of who we have here already because we're not uh, i mean we can deport people who are here illegally certainly uh, but we're not uh we're not going to change the fact that we're certainly a multiracial um uh, you know democracy here in the united states so the question is how can you create a common culture a common feeling of being a common history um around where we are today now uh, i wouldn't have put us where we are today i think it's a it's a challenging project but it's a project that the right should not shy away from trying to do and trying to define uh, because if not the left is going to do it for us in ways that i think will be really unsustainable for the american project over the long term yeah i think that's critical it, it's so easy to get terrified and i see a lot of these people who are supposed to be on the new right running away from this issue just screaming with their hair on fire oh no we can we can you know organize around the logos we can stay a creedal nation it's mm -hmm. like guys that's obviously not working for you like that that that, right. that project has has failed whether it's it's an inherent failure of the organizing mechanism or one that was due to you know multiple decisions that were made along the way when it comes to things like immigration and integration, it, it's hard to say. But the, it's very clear that the left has the advantage here. They've understood the the reason that the left is winning on this issue and owns this issue pretty much in its entirety is that they recognize the contradictions and it's part of their game plan to point out the contradictions. And sitting there and saying there are no contradictions, it'll all just be fine. Yeah, the left has a terrible vision. It's going to destroy everyone. But at right. least they understand that some section of reality and the person who has some grasp on this is going to win because people can kind of smell that reality behind it. Sure. And it's really white Christian Americans, since we were talking about Christian nationalism, that have kind of are the, are the most retarded, if you'll pardon me using a, the R word, in that way. I mean, they just... They can't see it and you know we can speculate as to why if they're sort of so um so used to being the majority they can't think in any other way or any broader way or they just they've been brainwashed or or whatever have you but i think it's it's you know everybody else has kind of woken up and and figured out what time it is and a lot of uh you know a lot of people who should really be with us who are conservatives uh are kind of engaging in this solely creedal nation family by which uh, fantasy, which I'm not suggesting that trying to have a set of common principles is a is a bad thing, or that we shouldn't try oh, yeah, to, yeah. Um, you know, articulate the 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 goals of the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, or say this is important or teach them. And I think uh, certainly an area that you and I would uh, I think agree on is that uh, there is no neutral ground in the education system, and that we should be unashamedly teaching these sorts of things in schools. The question is whether we really have the level of unanimity in terms of the leadership of society to kind of have anything resembling a uniform vision of what that looks like. And I think that unfortunately we don't. So uh, it's not that I'm suggesting that the ideological elements of nationhood are uh, irrelevant. I'm just suggesting that they are far from sufficient and that we need to recognize that uh, sooner rather than later uh, as we're trying to look to to kind of reconstitute an American nation on, on a little bit better lines than we're doing right now. Yeah, and that seems very clear for a lot of people. You know, I wrote an, an article, here, article here recently about uh, the history uh, podcaster Dan Carlin, who, who recognized that there was no magical dirt under Israel and that if Palestinians moved in and, and right. gained you know, suffrage inside that nation, they would fundamentally transform the nation. 
for some reason, that seems very difficult then for people to kind of move over and apply to the United States. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe the dirt in, in America is just that much more magic, but it seems like there there's this lack of understanding. And you would think that facing the consequences of multiculturalism, looking at the protests that are going on, the kind of, kind of the terrified look that a lot of left wing, uh, you know, progressives have had towards the way that, that, that many of their more radical flanks are, are addressing say, you know, Jewish people now that they're protesting Israel, you would think that they would understand the kind of the wages of what they're pushing for, but this just doesn't seem to bring any kind of critical thinking into frame. Right. Well, I mean, denial is not just a river in Egypt, right? I mean, it's really that there's a lot of that going on, unfortunately, in the right. I mean, we don't, we don't want to accept that we sort of, we sort of failed in this strong elements of the American project here uh, in recent years. And uh, as you point out, you know, there's sort of one standard for Israel and there's a very different standard for how the same people in good faith even are looking at the the American project or there's one standard for Ukraine and there's another standard for how we're supposed to look at it in the American project. I mean, and it's, people are uncomfortable. I, I say all the time and, and it's, you know, it's an unfashionable thing. I mean, in my view, broadly speaking, diversity in a society is bad. Uniformity more uniformity is good. Now you can disagree with that. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we should all sort of be the same in some sort of Stepford Wives society, but it is to say that in general, when you have polity, a polity that considers itself really diverse, that tends to be a polity that you know winds up in really unpleasant civil wars. And that if it's a more unified polity that sort of sees itself as all part of the same civilizational project, that's a good thing. And that's not to suggest that any particular group of people is bad. It's to suggest that having, you know, several different distinct groups uh, trying to constitute one country, but not really having a lot in common, that in and of itself is not a good thing. And we shouldn't be shy, in my view, about saying that. And I certainly try to, to say that pretty clearly. Yeah, it is amazing to watch a bunch of, again, evangelical Christians who are terrified of the idea of Christian nationalism immediately rush and say, but we have to defend a Jewish state, well, explicitly right. Jewish state. It's 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 critical. And there's there's no holds barred in 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 what kind of money and resources that should immediately be, you know, sent to kind of fulfill this vision. And so I guess the question for a lot of people is. What could be some of these things that could bind the United States together? You mentioned that, that that's an issue that you are exploring in the book. I yeah. think that, of course, a, a shared religion is a key part of that. But, yeah. you know, as we said, that's that's not the only thing. What what are some of the other things that, you know, would, would this have to be a regional project for the United States? Is it, is it something that could go nationwide? What, what would be some of the things that would entail? Well, religion, certainly. Um, language would be another element where you really uh, get into it. And, and obviously, most people in the U.S. speak English, and that's more true generationally, but I think we could do a lot more. I mean, we theoretically have laws on the books that you can't become a U.S. citizen unless you know English, and those are completely uh, violated in practice, um, or even doing things simply as, you know, you have an English language ballot, period, you know, and that's how we, we do things. Um, I do think that you can sort of, there, there's a, um, there is a, a, a scholar in England, um, Eric Kaufman, who wrote an interesting book called White Shift. And uh, Eric is himself uh, sort of multiracial. And he sort of talks about what might be called uh, multiracial whiteness, which is sometimes used as a, a kind of humorous term. But it's essentially the idea that you may have groups from a variety of different ethnic backgrounds or mixed ethnic backgrounds, which is obviously the fastest growing group in the United States that over time kind of tend to uh, identify uh, with the founders um, and uh, they, they kind of see themselves. And interestingly, uh, somebody like Barack Obama could have done this. I mean, Barack Obama is not descended from any American slaves, but he is descended from American slave owners and founders. You know, he chose to um, kind of adopt, and again, I'm not trying to beat up on him completely for doing this because there are there are reasons why uh, you know he may look in the mirror and and, and choose to like say, well, I'm going to identify with uh, African Americans, but it's not necessary that that would happen. He could have easily told a different story about himself, and in fact, uh, one of his siblings who actually lives in China effectively kind of did that and never understood 
uh, Barack Obama's sort of obsession uh, with his blackness in that way, as opposed to some of the other ways in which he would have been tied um, uh, to America's history. So these things do come down to to choices that we make, choices that we tell about ourselves. And interestingly, again, the most dramatic example that you could probably point to of all of, of the kind of why this doesn't necessarily need to be uh, the difference between an ethnos and, and race is here in Hungary, where I happen to be for a few weeks. Hungary has a mythological identity. It's actually not mythological. Sorry, I misspoke. Um, Hungary was sort of conquered uh, about a thousand years ago by Central Asian nomads. And it, I, it, it picked up a language from those people that is totally distinct language in the world, except I think it has some relationship with Finnish, but, Finnish, but it's not at all like any of their Central European neighbors. Um, they picked up a sort of cultural identity of themselves as kind of being descended from these sort of Central Asian warriors in some parts. But it turns out if you actually kind of look at the history and the genetic history that we've been able to do over the last 20 years, all of those Central Asians and their descendants for the most part, with you know tiny, tiny exception, were sort of elite uh, in Hungarian society. They were wiped out like 700 years ago. And so if you look, Hungarians are genetically pretty much the, like all of their Central Asian neighbors, but they have this, or Central, excuse me, Central European neighbors, but they have this very strong ethnos, this identity that's very unique that has to do with their um, shared history, even though it's not a genetic history, it's a cultural history. And so that's that's about as dramatic an example as you're going to get um, of, of how I think ethnos can be very different than than how we would think of, of, of race and how culture kind of plays into these these issues, but I think that there are a lot of things that we can do in the U.S. that we can unify around, um, whether it be language, whether it be religion in many cases, whether it be a kind of multi-ethnic identification uh, with the founders or with ancestry you might have that, that goes back to earlier periods of American history. And we could choose to do that. We just haven't historically chosen to do that, at least over the last half century. Yeah, I, I think a really key part is, of course, also the a moratorium on immigration or almost a complete stop because you have to stabilize the population. I think there have right. been many points inside American history where we probably were moving towards an ethnogenesis, where we probably were yeah. move, moving towards a true identity, a real understanding of what American was you know, going forward. But then we have these massive influxes of immigration that radically alter the landscape of the United States change, especially the urban centers and their populations. Uh, they, they change the balance of power, especially in the democratic system. It doesn't allow you to heal some critical relations, of course, as well. I mean, look at the, the special relationship, at least that African-Americans used to have as a minority population in the United States, when they were a, when it, when they were almost a singular minority population, they had sure. a much more powerful uh, kind of link in history to what was going on. Now it's just one of many, and it seems like it's more and more difficult for them to continue to maintain a, a seat at the table, if not for kind of a linchpin role that they play inside a democratic coalition. And so you lose that ability to kind of, I think, reconcile issues in fact exacerbating those issues continues to be a key part of uh, driving the democratic process rather than letting everything heal and to, again kind of congealing into one ethno sure and, and you mentioned particularly with african americans i mean i, I think right now greater than 15 percent of today's african americans are either african immigrants themselves or descendants of 20th or 21st century african immigrants so already you begin to get some splits in that population uh, that have very different histories uh, that they're telling each other about themselves. But even among uh, non-African Americans, if you look kind of, if you go back, because I think immigration really is the key and having essentially almost a net zero immigration for a significant period of time would be the key. If you look at, at kind of what was almost the, the heyday of, of like cheesy level Americanness in people's minds. It was the 1950s, maybe, and that's not a coincidence that in, in the 1920s uh, we have the Johnson Reed Act, the most strict immigration law that America has ever passed. That goes on until 1965, when you have Hart Seller that that kind of opens the floodgates and brings our current immigration. But it's really this kind of like late 50s timeframe where we've had very little immigration. 
We've had also the experience of uh, the army going to war together, where you have like the multi-ethnic buddy movie that's almost the cliche of you know the Italian soldier and the Jewish soldier and the you know upper uh, you know upper New England soldier, and they all get together and they all become American. But we really did begin to cohere in this in this kind of process of ethnogenesis, um, where we became this unified American people. And again, I, I'm I'm oversimplifying that, obviously, but there, there was a strong element of that. And then in 1965, we open up the floodgates um, to everyone and anyone. And now we are kind of uh, a Babylon of uh, Tower of Babel, rather, I guess, of, of squabbling nations and languages, uh, you know, all sitting inside the same state. And we, you know, in, in many ways, it also kind of feels like we're just at the looting stage of uh, <laughs> the empire at this point, And nobody really knows how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Yeah, I also wonder about some of the key cultural elements. You know, you, you you made the mention there, of course, people going to war together was was a key binding thing. And another big part of, of course, that that uh, big push towards ethnogenesis during that time was the unification of, I think, uh, a narrative in the school system, public education becoming, becoming uniform, Absolutely. television, shared radio programs for the first time, people on entirely different ends of the country could uniformly get the same culture delivered and that kind of allowed for that unification in many ways. But the big problem of course is, is the people in charge of all of this stuff. It, yes. It right. would of course be great if we could have a unifying, uh, you know, educational system and media yeah. apparatus, you know, pa Patrick Deneen in his new book regime change talked about, you know, mandatory civic service, creating that, that kind of wartime camaraderie, all of those things seem good, except of course the problem is they would be, the government in charge of all of these things and the government is trying to actively destroy everything good in right. society. So, so yes, if we could have, if we could, we could forge a positive identity, if we just wielded the entire total state, but unfortunately yeah. it seems like, seems like uh, that, that's not in the near future. So, so what does that mean? Well, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, for just what you said, and I think we've got a variety of potential things we can do and none of them are great options for I think the reasons that you just outlined, I'd say one of the things you can do and you're beginning to see as we are beginning to see real political sorting um, geographically happening at, at increasing rates in the United States, I think at the city level and even at the state level, more importantly, which is where it matters a little bit because as much as the feds have kind of tried to erode state sovereignty, states really do practically still have some sovereignty in some important areas. but. You know, you, you get the sort of stories that we're talking about. You get the sort of plans we're starting about. You see it at a state level, maybe in ways that we've seen in a state like Florida, which has kind of pushed some aggressive things in, in this domain and obviously has a very uh, diverse population that they're working with in doing that. Or in a state like Montana, where I live, uh, you know, we're also doing some things. So I think that the best thing we can probably do right now is to assertively have the total state working at a state level. I don't know, that probably violates your uh, your your broader formulation, but but it's the best I can kind of come up with is that you, you sort of have that working in, in smaller geographic units and hopefully the thing that you create is appealing enough that maybe some other folks decide that they're gonna take it on or maybe you kind of wind up with, with a few very different um, versions of what America looks like, but they're all kind of able at least to kind of muddle along under the same umbrella in some way. Again, none of those are ideal solutions, but they're they're better than what we have now. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm with you that the regional solution is the is the best one though, because I'm not long on the you know American project. I don't I don't, I don't know that the America as we see it now is, is going to be able to hold together. But that does mean that your regional project becomes even more important. I guess that is is the next thing I'd ask you about this. It seems like democracy is a big problem here. You know, that again, yeah. like, like I said, the, the these multi-ethnic, you know, the empires have existed successfully before. They're real, but they almost uniformly were, again, run in, in non-democratic ways. And you had kind of these regional rulerships that were allowed to be given the level of flexibility for each group to kind of do its own thing, you know, have its own rules, yeah. have its own culture, custom, those kind of things. And they still kick back to the central state. They still kick back to, to kind of the, the governing entity. 
uh, allowing them to stay as one political organizing unit while operating independently enough to not let their differences destroy each other. Yeah, I mean, you begin to see, I mean, I, I've heard talks about talk about this where in California, you're beginning to see this sort of ethnic enclavism almost take root. And maybe again, this is like an acceptable third best sort of solution where um, we, we do some things that um, kind of alter existing civil rights law, which is run totally off the rails and also in many ways, totally con contrary to the existing, the intent of the law when it was put in. Um, but you sort of restore a lot of private freedom of association for people. And maybe they begin to self-organize in some groups that are a little more sustainable and uh, they kind of work as communities where we do have this uh, greater level of agreement. They run their own affairs to a significant degree, but there's, you know, there's a central state that is ultimately overarching it. They're each kicking back to the central state because ultimately they decide that there is enough value in that central state that they want to keep it, it going, but people can kind of live in ways that are more appealing to them uh, individually. I, I think there are some opportunities to do that, but it's really hard to know exactly how that's gonna develop. It's sort of contingencies upon contingencies and all you can kind of do is try to think about it and be ready. And when opportunities present themselves to sort of push forward, as, you know, as, as Rahm Emanuel said, never let a crisis go to waste. So I think we're not gonna have a shortage of crises and we just need to be ready to uh, come up with attractive alternatives to uh, have governance uh, post those crises. Yeah, I, I tend to think, and of course, you know, situations are, are of course wildly different at the moment. But there, there, there is a little peering into possible futures. Hopefully not. But, but there, you know, South Africa and kind of what Afroforum has done in many ways with their organization, where you know, they're, they're, the central government is just a failure. They're, they're not going to to solve most of their problems. And so they're building their own colleges. They're building their own electric grids. They're, you know, filling yeah. in their potholes. They're running neighborhood watches. And they're organizing along cultural lines. You know, you have to speak Afrikaans to, to join certain communities. But these things are, they're coordinating with other communities. These are, these are multi-ethnic coalitions that are, are working to defend their ability to have these regional communities and, and, and protect themselves from what is a wider kind of devolving situation inside their nation. Yeah. And actually in many ways, South Africa is often cited as, as a really bad example of like, Oh my gosh, what's going to happen. But in some ways you could see it as a very optimistic example, because guess what? We are for a variety of reasons. We're not going to go anywhere near, I think the level of dysfunctionality that the South African state has, I think just the, the numbers and the balance and the inter-ethnic dynamics and the history, it's just, it's all much more favorable here. And in South Africa, I think it's much more unfavorable toward having a long-term peaceful solution. And yet they do seem to be muddling along, uh, not in a great situation, but, but essentially uh, people are building their own institutions and things are working functionally. It should be at least in theory, dramatically more easy to do that in a U.S. context with different groups. And again, those, those groups do not necessarily, or even uh, most probably are not going to be defined along anything like purely racial lines or, or even uh, you know, cultural lines per se. They may be ideological, they may be whatever, they, they could be a million different permutations that we can't even begin to imagine. But essentially you, you build these different communities that decide that they're able to live together, at least in peace, um, with their neighbors as long as they can get their own autonomy and they kick enough back to the central state that things uh, can still function there. And I, I don't think that that's um, at all unrealistic. And as, as other people have said, I'm, I'm sort of short the United States, but I'm long America or maybe America's, we should say, in this context. And, and I'm certainly long Americans. I mean, I think we've still got mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of talent. Uh, we've got a tremendous amount of goodwill. You can kind of come here and say, oh, my gosh, things look so dysfunctional. But then when you compare it to the vast majority of other places in the world, we still have a lot of capital of all types, uh, including human capital that are built up here. I'm with you. Yeah, I, I don't mean to to spread out too many black pills here. I do think you're right that there is still a, a good future. I think a lot of people are too married to the idea that if you don't have exactly the project you have now, 
then there can't be a bright future tomorrow. And I think sure. it's critical to, to remember that the nation is the people, not not a, a random assortment of kind of uh, government structures that you hope kind of perpetuate for eternity. And I think, uh, like you said, I'm, I'm long on the American people for sure. So, sure. so before we go, I want to ask you one more thing. Like you said, you're in Hungary. Uh, we have uh, kind of kind of the nationalism conference with 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 uh, Harzoni. There are multiple places that are kind of looking at this international nationalist movement. Yeah, uh, which which is uh, ironic, but I think kind of necessary. What we have now is this drive for the global village. It's this drive towards uh, th this global understanding of what a nation is and and forcing that definition onto everybody from Woodrow Wilson on. This has been kind of a, a key project that has just destroyed a lot of a, a, a lot of uh, uh, peoples, but. Um, the thing that I think is going to be critical is kind of a, a understanding of a multipolar world in which these nations are allowed to exist and they don't have to be forced onto each other's identities, don't have to be forced on each other. They're willing to, to come to at least at some level, the defense of each other. Uh, I don't know exactly how that jives with, with, with a certain level of isolationism that a lot of people, myself included, would like, would like to express. But what do you think about these, these international nationalist movements and their future? Yeah. I'm a huge fan of international nationalism. It's, it's one of many ways uh, what I'm here uh, study, studying in Hungary with my friends at the Danube Institute is what that looks like in a Hungarian context, which is not the same. I mean, I think this is really the key to your, your project that you've laid out here. That's not the same as what it looks like in an American context. It's not even the same as what it looks like in a Polish context or a French context. I mean, there's this is a unique people. They have a unique history. They have a unique culture. There are going to be certain things. There are going to be certain things even around the identification with Christianity or particularly Catholicism here that are not going to be the way that we're going to do things in the U.S. That's okay. And I think the key is to have that sense of healthy nationalism, healthy national pride, healthy sense of belonging and identity without getting into sort of weird nationalist supremacism, which I think has always been the weakness of nationalism, not just to kind of proclaim that I'm happy with my group and my nation, you know, and I like how it is, but to sort of say, and you know, we're better and therefore we need to go dominate all these other nations and to sort of be very respectful of other people's traditions, of their sovereignties, of their cultures, to not kind of think that we can come in and sort of democratize uh, the world as we try to do in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and I don't think that those projects turned out very well, um, but to just really have that that healthy level of respect for difference to accept that nationalism indeed is an international project. And I think maybe that's ultimately the key. It's an international project. It's not a globalist project. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to kind of have one, you know, undifferentiated mass of everybody consuming the same entertainment, same religion, same culture, et cetera, but that we can have unique cultural differences within nations and that that's actually a good thing. It's actually part of, you know, I'd even argue it's like the different faces of God that you see in uh, different nations, different cultural groups. Um, this is a good thing. And we don't want to just sort of, um, you know, make this all uh, try to to make this all one good thing, which will actually end up making it all one terrible thing. We need to, to respect um, people's rights to um, maintain their own cultures, their own languages, their own ethnic identities, uh, and understand that that's actually ultimately a positive thing and not uh, a negative thing. Globalism is kind of the, the danger much more than nationalism. Absolutely. All right, Jeremy, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up, but is there anything people should be looking for? I know you said you have a book coming up. Anything else that people should be keeping an eye out for? Yeah, well, I have the book coming out uh, next year um, where I look at uh, kind of in the context of this, the way that... Um, kind of anti-whiteism has become a really uh, unifying force uh, on particularly the left in the United States and sort of how that plays out. It very much plays into these ethnic issues, these national issues. So I'll, uh, look for that uh, in the next February, March timeframe. I've got my Twitter feed uh, at Jeremy Carl Ford that you should certainly follow. And I put uh, links to new articles that I'm working on, including a piece on Christian nationalism right now that should be out in the next bit of time. But uh, you know, always a pleasure to speak with you, Aaron, and uh, look forward to chatting more in the future. Absolutely. All right, guys. Thank you for watching this episode. If you'd like to go ahead 
and get these broadcasts as podcasts. Make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the Orin McIntyre Show on your favorite podcast platform. And of course, if this is your first time on the YouTube channel, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe. Thank you for watching, everybody. Thanks to Jeremy for coming on. And as always, I'll talk to you guys next time.